Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank, on behalf of NCAPA, the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, I would like to thank you for joining us today for this important webinar on diabetes and Asian Americans and the Screen at 23 campaign. Uh, my name is Ian Rick John. I am the policy director at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum based in Oakland, California. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Health Forum, we're a national health policy nonprofit organization with the mission to influence policy, mobilize communities, and strengthen programs and organizations to improve the health of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Island Islanders in the U.S. and its jurisdiction. And I also serve as the co-chair of the NCAPA Health Committee. Before we begin today, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items for our webinar. Um, all participants in this webinar will be automatically muted so we don't hear any of your background noises. Um, throughout the webinar, we will have the opportunity to, you will have the opportunity to enter questions. If you look at your screen, there's a chat box, a chat feature. You can type in questions um, as whenever they pop into your head, please feel free to type in your questions. At the end of the webinar, we'll have time to take those questions. So make sure that you do that during the webinar. And this webinar is being recorded today and will be available on our YouTube channel probably in, in the next couple of days um, when we post the webinar. And now I'd like to invite Kelly Honda, who is the Policy and Membership Manager for NCAPA, to provide a brief overview of NCAPA and the work that we do. Kelly? Thanks, Ian. Um, again, my name is Kelly Honda. I'm the Policy Membership Manager at NCAPA. Um, NCAPA is the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, and it's a broad coalition of 35 national Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander organizations. Uh, we're based here in Washington, D.C., and our goal is to be the national voice of the Asian American Pacific Islander communities in the federal policy sphere, and we work directly with the White House, administration, federal agencies, and Congress to impact public policy. Can I get the next slide, Ian? Um, our organizational structure includes an executive committee. We have five policy committees, and we're supported by a small but robust team of full-time staff. Our committees are civil and human rights, education, health, housing and economic justice, and immigration. And these committees are chaired and comprised of NCAPA members. Um, and for the health committee, the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum and the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, they lead our health policy issues. And our committee works on broad issues, including health disparities, language access, and the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so thank you, and welcome to everyone. I'll turn it back to Ian. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and now I'd like to um, turn it over to David Hawks, the Communications Manager for the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians, uh, to say a few words about NCAPIP and to introduce our two featured speakers for today. Uh, David? Thanks, Ian. Um, I'd like to thank NCAPA first for hosting this webinar and a special thanks to the Japanese American Citizens League and Priscilla Ochida for initiating this webinar on behalf of the AANHPI Diabetes Coalition and the Screen at 23 campaign. Um, I'm David Hawks. I'm the Communications and Programs Manager for the National Council of API Physicians, and I coordinate the Screen at 23 campaign for the AANHPI Diabetes Coalition. Um, as the name of the campaign implies, the campaign was created to get more Asian Americans screened for type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is a big issue for Americans, but for Asian Americans it's especially problematic. Um, I'd like to introduce our two speakers and thank them for taking the time. Um, Dr. Happy Araneta is a professor of epidemiology at UC San Diego School of Medicine, and she was the principal investigator for the Filipino Health Study as well as a lead author on many of the studies that have informed our knowledge base on diabetes among Asian Americans. And it's a lot of her work that led to the changing guidelines for screening Asian Americans at a lower body mass index of 23. Dr. Edward Chow is a physician and current president of the health, the current, health uh, current president of the Health Commission for the City of San Francisco, as well as the co-chair of the AANHPI Diabetes Coalition. He has decades of experience as a medical director, healthcare administrator, and public health leader in the San Francisco Bay Area, California, and nationally 
Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Ian. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Happy Araneta. Thank you very much. Thank you to all for organizing this important webinar. And for those of you who are calling in, we, we are relying on you and your constituents to get the word out to screen at 23. Next slide, please. The American Diabetes Association recommends diabetes screening for adults age 45 years and older who are overweight with at least one diabetes risk factor that appears in the yellow box and includes belonging to a high-risk racial or ethnic group such as Asian or Pacific Islander. In January of 2015, the American Diabetes Association revised the screening guidelines by lowering the body mass index cut point of 25 kilograms per meter squared in all ethnic groups to a BMI of 23 for Asian Americans. So for a woman who's 5 foot 1, the old guidelines would have required screening anyone over 132 pounds, and that's now lowered to anyone greater than 122 pounds at that height of 5 1. Next slide, please. California is ethnically diverse, where almost two-thirds are ethnic minorities, and it's home to the largest Asian Pacific Islander population. Data from 2 million members of Kaiser Permanente Hospitals in Northern California showed that diabetes prevalence was highest among Pacific Islanders, primarily Native Hawaiians and Samoans, Filipinos, and South Asians. And they had higher prevalence compared to Latinos, African Americans, and Native Americans, groups perceived to be at highest risk for diabetes. And this really shocked the medical community. You'll notice that Southeast Asian, Japanese, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, and other Asians also had higher diabetes prevalence compared to whites. Next slide. This graph demonstrates the importance of disaggregating Asian and Pacific Islander subgroups. Diabetes incidence appears similar when you compare African Americans and Latinos compared to all Asians and Pacific Islanders when reported collectively and circled in red. However, once disaggregated, Pacific Islanders have almost twice the diabetes incidence of African Americans, and South Asians and Filipinos have 50% higher diabetes incidence compared to all other ethnic groups in a population with similar access to care at Kaiser Permanente Hospitals. Next slide. The orange line represents a body mass index of 30, which is a marker for clinical obesity. You'll notice that whites, blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders with incident or new diabetes in gray and diabetes prevalence in white, and even some non-diabetics in black all had a mean body mass index above this orange obesity line, whereas the mean BMI of Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, and South Asians with either newly diagnosed or prevalent diabetes or below this orange obesity line. Next slide. Several studies have shown that Asians, such as Dr. Yajnik on your right with a beard, have significantly more body fat compared to whites of similar BMI. Both gentlemen have a low BMI of 22, but the South Asian man has twice the body fat. 21% compared to 9% in the Caucasian man. Next slide. Visceral adipose tissue is not just a place where we store our excess calories, but it's an active endocrine organ which releases cytokines that have an important role in glucose homeostasis. This CT image shows a 6 millimeter slice between the L4 and L5 vertebrae. And you notice that the overweight African-American woman on your left with a BMI of 25 has tw 25 cubic centimeters of this harmful visceral adipose tissue that's shown in red. Whereas the Filipino-American woman on your right who is considered normal weight or perhaps even underweight at 5 foot 4, 115 pounds with a BMI of 20 and a 26 inch waistline has 84 cubic centimeters of visceral adipose tissue 
three times the volume of the overweight African American women. And such excess visceral fat accumulation has also been reported in South Asian, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese populations. Next slide. Before 2015, the American Diabetes Association guidelines suggested screening for type 2 diabetes should be considered in asymptomatic adults ages 45 years and older with a BMI of 25 or higher and one known diabetes risk factor. However, Asian Americans manifest diabetes at lower BMIs and might not be screened. Our objective was to identify the optimum BMI cut points for diabetes screening among Asian American adults. Next slide. We searched the medical literature and identified only four clinical studies which performed an oral glucose tolerance test, that's the gold standard, to ascertain type 2 diabetes in Asian Americans. They included the University of California San Diego Filipino Health Study, the North Kohala Study in the Big Island of Hawaii, the Masala Study of South Asians in San Francisco and Chicago, and the Seattle Japanese Diabetes Community Study. Next slide. Participants reported race, ethnicity, and had no non-Asian admixture. They had no prior diagnosis of diabetes. All had measures of body mass index and fasting and two-hour glucose values from the oral glucose tolerance test, and glycosylated hemoglobin was available from all sites except for Filipino men in San Diego and Japanese participants in Seattle. Next slide, please. Type 2 diabetes was defined as having an HbA1c of 6.5% or higher, or a fasting glucose after a minimum 8-hour fast of 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher, or a 2-hour post-challenge glucose level of 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher. Next slide. Statistical analyses included receiver operating characteristic curve analysis, calculations of sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value, and the selection of optimal BMI cut points included reviewing UDENS index values, misclassification rates, the BMI cut point or sensitivity approximate specificity, and finally a target sensitivity of 80%. This is where we would capture at least 80% of Asian Americans with diabetes. Next slide. Among our 1,663 participants, 58% were women, one-third were Filipino, 37% were South Asian, and 30% were Japanese. The mean age was 59.7 years, and the BMI, mean BMI was 25.4, so they're right at the overweight cut point. Next slide, please. The age-adjusted prevalence of type 2 diabetes was 16.9% overall. It was 22.8% among Filipinos and 13% in Japanese and South Asians. Next slide, please. There were 1,214 participants with all three glucose measures, and among these people, type 2 diabetes prevalence was 18%. However, if you only measure diabetes by A1C cut points, diabetes prevalence is only 9.2%. So by limiting screening to just A1C measures, you only identify half of Asian Americans with type 2 diabetes. Only 5.5% had fasting hyperglycemia. But the majority in orange, 15.5% had post-challenge glucose levels exceeding 200. This means that if screening is limited to just the A1C test and fasting glucose measures only, almost half, 44% of Asian Americans with diabetes, those with isolated post-challenge hyperglycemia, that is, they have normal A1C, normal fasting glucose but elevated two-hour post-challenge glucose might remain undiagnosed without an oral glucose tolerance test. Next slide, please. 
the mean BMI was 26.7 kilograms per meter squared at the time of diabetes diagnosis. However, if you look at the direction of the red arrow, 37% of women and 21% of men had BMIs less than 25 and would not be screened using the older guidelines. And some even had BMIs as low as 16. That's a woman who is 5 foot 4 and 93 pounds when diagnosed with diabetes for the first time. Next slide. If screening was limited to a BMI cut point of 25, the sensitivity is just 64%, which suggests that one-third, those 102 in red of the total 281 with diabetes might remain undiagnosed since their BMI is less than 25. Next slide. You'll see that sensitivity ranges from 85% to 36%, and the misclassification rate is relatively similar regardless of the BMI cut points. And sensitivity and specificity was closest to each other. That's another criteria to assess the optimum cut point at a BMI of 25, but again would fail to diagnose one-third of Asian Americans with diabetes. Next slide, please. This is another method to identify the optimum cut points. The sensitivity is shown in the total sample in black among Filipinos in orange. Japanese in blue and South Asians in red. At a BMI of 23, the sensitivity is at least 80% or higher for all Asian subgroups. And UDIN's index values in burgundy down below um, are similarly low at each BMI cut point between 23 or 27. So lowering, increasing the BMI cut point doesn't improve the ability to predict Next slide, please. Since the misclassification rate and UDIN's index were similar across BMI cut points, we used the targeted sensitivity that would identify 80% of Asian Americans with diabetes and identified an optimum BMI cut point of 23.5, which applied to the total population as well as among women, Filipinos and South Asians, and a cut point of 22.8 among Japanese Americans. Next slide, please. When stratified by diabetes diagnosis, the optimal BMI cut points range from 24 for those diagnosed by glycosylated hemoglobin to a BMI of 23.2 for those with post-challenge glucose above 200 milligrams per deciliter. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the old guidelines of screening at a BMI of 25 or higher may fail to identify one of every three Asian Americans with diabetes. A BMI cut point of 23 kilograms per meter squared may be most practical for Asian Americans. However, limiting screening to just the A1C and fasting glucose measures fails to identify almost half of Asian Americans with diabetes, reiterating the importance of the oral glucose tolerance test measures and reiterating the importance to continue seeking the, uh, trying to understand the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes among Asian Americans. Next slide, please. Doctors Will Shu, Alka Kanea, Jane Chang, Will Fujimoto, and I were delighted to write this position statement for the ADA and hope that the new screening guidelines facilitate early diagnosis and management of type 2 diabetes and again reinforces awareness of ethnic differences in the etiology of type 2 diabetes. Our strengths and limitations are presented here. The strengths include population and community-based samples, and diabetes was ascertained by glycosylated hemoglobin and OGTT in all participants. However, our data is not representative of all Asian Americans, and we need cohort studies to understand 
the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes in other Asian American cohorts, including Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Cambodian populations. And I'd like to end by thanking our participants. Data to inform these new guidelines would not have been possible without the commitment of our study participants, our communities, research teams, and multiple funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anarda. Thank you for all that information. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Edward Chow, and he's going to talk a little bit about the Screen at 23 campaign. Dr. Chow? Thank you. And, and I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to discuss this uh, very important topic. Uh, uh, Dr. Arenada has eloquently presented the evidence uh, over these uh, several years and as compiled uh, and summarized in her paper uh, in 2015, which was able to help uh, change the guidelines for the American Diabetes Association's uh, criteria for, for beginning uh, to uh, look for diabetes in our population to uncover those so that we would be able to treat and be able to ameliorate any of the serious consequences from having untreated and uncontrolled diabetes. So with that and the ability to move forward, uh, the uh, Diabetes Coalition then launched the Screen at 23 program in 2015. Uh, and I'll uh, discuss uh, briefly uh, how we have been working with the uh, providers and with our communities to try to increase awareness so that we would be able to use the new cut point and be able to identify additional people who are at risk for diabetes before consequences of diabetes hits them. Uh, therefore, improving the quality of life and the quality of health for these patients. Next slide, please. To reiterate, uh, the Asian American population is approximately 6% of the U.S. population and the fastest growing racial ethnic group in the U.S. That is uh, nearly uh, over 18 and a half million of 314 million people uh, who are classified as American. The term Asian that we are using is as defined here uh, from the Far East, Southeast Asia, and the Indian subcontinent. The largest Asian American subpopulations in the United States are Chinese at 23%, Filipino at 20%, Asian Indian at 18%, and Vietnamese and Korean at 10% each. Uh, this is from uh, the American Community Survey data of 2014 updating the U.S. Census. Uh, next screen, please. Overall in the United States, diabetes affects nearly 20, uh, over 29 million people, which is approximately one out of every 11. But in fact, in the Asian population, that's actually uh, at least uh, one out of every 10. And as Dr. Arenada pointed out, and the study from Kaiser here in California pointed out, this varies considerably by the subpopulations. So that populations such as the Filipino population are in double digits, uh, while the Chinese population, for example, is only several percent above the Caucasian norm. Here it says that in the United States, one out of four do not know they have diabetes. Recent studies from NHANES have shown that one out of two Asians, in fact, do not know that they have diabetes. Another reason that the Screen at 23 campaign is so important. Next slide, please. The 10 leading causes of death in 2009 in the United States had diabetes in seventh place amongst the Caucasians and in fifth place amongst the Asian and Pacific Islanders. Next slide, please. That, of course, did not even discuss the morbidity, that is, the consequences of living with diabetes, which <clears throat> with earlier diagnosis, 
could be avoided. <clears throat> Here again is merely to show that in the Asian population, one out of every two who have diabetes are actually undiagnosed in the United States. Next, please. <clears throat> the uh, campaign to look at the issue of diabetes in the United States amongst Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders was begun in 2011 by a group of interested organizations and individuals that came together in a conference uh, that was then documented as <coughs> in diabetes care uh, coming from the papers uh, on the, in the uh, 2011 symposium that was organized by NCAPID, the National Council of Asian and Pacific Islander uh, Physicians, uh, and led to the formation of the Coalition for uh, the uh, Asian Pacific Islander Diabetes Coalition. <coughs> the data from this uh, was published in Diabetes Care the following year and began the quest then to look at what would be uh, scientific evidence that Dr. Renata uh, presented so eloquently uh, this morning to say that the BMI should be 23. <clears throat> the World Health Organization over a decade ago had already recognized that in Asia the BMI was noted to be lower than the international BMI of 25 that was also accepted here in the United States. But evidence was needed to demonstrate that this actually would be applicable to Asian Americans. And over the next several years, researchers and studies then demonstrated to the satisfaction of the ADA that, in fact, the guidelines should be changed. Next slide, please. <coughs> uh, these are the members of the coalition, which includes the American Diabetes Association, the Jocelyn Diabetes Center's Asian American Diabetes Initiative at Harvard, uh, and CAPED as our administrator and organizer, and 18 other national and regional organizations, including such uh, academic institutions as the uh, University of Hawaii. Next, please. And you saw a copy of the paper that uh, we had talked about earlier with uh, Dr. Uh, Arunana and Dr. Shu as uh, some of our principal authors. That was the definitive work now discussing why 23 should be chosen. Next uh, slide, please. <coughs> um, this is the same guideline that Dr. Renata uh, emphasized, and uh, we placed this here again just to indicate that the uh, real key here is that Asian Americans at a BMI of 23 need to be screened. And uh, that uh, being Asian American by itself now has also been recognized uh, in this last year as being a high-risk uh, racial and ethnicity uh, group. Uh, next slide, please. The, scientific, uh, the science, therefore, does show that Asian Americans are different, and the guidelines today reflect this reality. Screening practices, therefore, must change to reflect these guidelines. As an aside at this point, uh, and certainly not to uh, make it less important, the Pacific Islander population is quite different in terms of what should be used. And uh, in fact, their prevalence of diabetes on the uh, Pacific Islands and in Hawaii is far greater, but for different reasons. And those reasons are what the Diabetes Coalition will now be studying, uh, will be uh, proposing to study uh, when it meets next uh, in August uh, here in San Francisco. So that these guidelines are reflective of what is needed for Asian Americans and not for Pacific Islanders. Next slide, please. The purpose of the Screen at 23 campaign, as uh, Mr. Hawks had indicated, was now to increase awareness and action amongst physicians, health authorities, and the general public of, these, of the more appropriate screening guidelines for Asian Americans. Having the evidence 
uh, is of no consequence unless we are able to get it down to the public. And therefore, the public and the providers need to be educated as to what uh, should be the screening cut points for Asian Americans. Next slide, please. Our efforts then began uh, following a successful campaign, which over the last several years, I'm sure many of you have heard about, which was the hepatitis free uh, program, Hep B Free, which was launched here in San Francisco initially as a grassroots campaign uh, by both providers and uh, affected constituents, and then became a nationwide movement. But it was uh, quite clear that, and the effectiveness of being able to work with the public immediately and to bring the information to providers as to the importance of screening for hepatitis B, because there was now ways of assisting those who might have that, and the ability for us to eradicate hepatitis B by the uh, new vaccinations uh, available really led to say that the Screen at 23 campaign could mirror this by working with the individual communities and individual provider and or organizations and plans uh, along with uh, just some, uh, along with uh, developing the guidelines upon which this would be based. So with good science behind it, uh, the uh, program was launched uh, with uh, first, a local campaign in San Francisco, uh, next slide please, in which we then uh, introduced a resolution at the city's health department uh, and passed that the city would follow uh, the screen at 23 for Asian Americans. Of course, San Francisco would be a very important uh, community for this to occur in since uh, over one-third of the population in this county are uh, Asian Americans. From there, we then obtained endorsement of over 35 organizations and leaders and uh, created a screen at 23 package, which included a type 2 diagnosis, a guideline for doctors seeing Asian American patients. Uh, you see there a uh, web, a uh, a URL that can be uh, utilized to uh, get more information. Next, please. From the campaign, then, we then uh, worked with the provider community to see that the information could be disseminated, all the way from uh, individual practice organizations, such as uh, Allied in Southern California, that sees over 300,000 patients with 2,000 physicians, to the uh, U.S. Burma Medical Society. We've worked with the Hawaii IPA, the San Francisco Medical Society, the Chinese American IPA, which also takes care of several hundred thousand in the New York City, uh, and the Philippine Medical Association as uh, examples of uh, working with the provider community. But it was also important to get the information out to our patients. Next slide, please. In order to do that, we then also went through uh, many of our organizations to inform them that this was the new guideline beginning in 2015 and that we should get information out to our community that ask your doctor about screening if I have a BMI of 23. Uh, and we're so pleased that NCAPA along with the Asian Forum, were part of the organizations that assisted in endorsing this and allowed us to then have a forum such as today to be able to continue to present this information to our public. Next slide, please. We're very pleased that on May 2nd, the state of Hawaii, which as you know is a majority Asian state, uh, passed the very first state resolution, then putting a state behind the BMI uh, 23. Dr. Will Fujimoto, uh, who is professor of medicine at the University of Washington, now retired, uh, back to his home in Hawaii, uh, has been working on this and was one of the 
uh, studies that were cited by Dr. Renata uh, uh, earlier, uh, working with the Japanese population, knowing that there was something different about the population that needed recognition uh, beyond uh, being uh, just simply a, uh, a, a note uh, in uh, somebody's census. Uh, and uh, he was so pleased to be able to and have uh, noted that his state has now become the first state to recognize that there is a difference and that Asian Americans need to be screened at 23 uh, when uh, uh, medically needed. Next uh, slide, please. Likewise, we have been working with uh, high-profile people uh, such as uh, Congressman Judy Chu uh, to also get the word out on a broader basis. So uh, our uh, hope would be that being able to present to this important organization and to those who are on our uh, webinar site here that many might be able to see that this would be an important message to be brought to uh, the uh, constituencies that you all have, and that uh, the Ivy's Coalition and uh, with NCAPIT are willing to uh, give whatever support and information uh, speakers have needed in order to bring that message to our populations. Uh, next slide, please. We have been working uh, with uh, also some of the other organizations to do such uh, I, uh, to do such projects as newsletters that the California Academy of Family Physicians, uh, who highlighted the need to screen at 23 in their letter to their constituency last January. Uh, organizations like the uh, Medi-Cal Plan, Cal Optima, has presented this also. Uh, in their newsletters to Medi-Cal and Medicare beneficiaries and their doctors. At Jocelyn, this was a uh, highlight uh, message at their Taste of Ginger and Dim Sum uh, Diabetes events. Uh, in Arizona, it was in their conference at the uh, Asian Pacific Communities Actions Diabetes Conference. Uh, the LA Times uh, presented uh, uh, a, a large uh, article, I should say, a major article in the newspaper concerning the importance of screening at 23 for the Asian community. So these are different examples of projects that could be undertaken. However, it might be either through churches or meetings, uh, other civic events, health fairs, that the word should get out that one should be aware that there is diabetes uh, in the Asian community. We all don't have to look corpulent or obese in order to be at risk, and that a screen at 23 should be considered uh, with your doctor. Next slide, please. Uh, we presented here some information uh, for uh, either calculating the BMI or for looking at uh, other uh, aids that could be helpful for those who have diabetes and may need assistance as uh, guidelines. All of these can be also further uh, looked at uh, through the websites or uh, certainly uh, discussion with our staff, uh, Mr. Hawks, uh, to uh, be able to connect to whatever uh, your organizations or your uh, communities may need. Next slide, please. So, uh, in conclusion, I again would like to thank uh, both uh, the uh, two organizations for giving us this opportunity to bring this uh, important uh, public health message, which we hope you can assist in disseminating to our Asian American communities uh, in America. Thank you very much, and I'll turn the discussion back over to our moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Chow and Dr. Araneta, for both, both the presentations and for that great information that you provided. So this is the time for you to enter any questions that you have, that you might have for 
either Dr. Chow or Dr. Araneta, if you can type in questions into the box, and I will go ahead and pose them as they come in. Uh, we have a couple of questions already in the, in the, that have come in. So one of the questions is, I think this is a reference to the study, when you say South Asian, are the study participants mainly Asian Indians, or does this group include other South, South Asian subgroups like Bangladeshis, Nepalese, Sri Lankans, etc.? This is Happy Araneta. The response is South Asians in the Masala cohort includes all the uh, South Asian subgroups you mentioned, including a large representation of Pakistani uh, participants in Chicago, as well as Nepalese people from Bangladesh, and, um, and of course, India. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Does the campaign screen at 23 target patients or physicians, or both? So yeah, this is Dr. Chow, and uh, we're targeting both. It's important that patients can uh, understand that they may be at risk, uh, they may have a family background, or they may then have uh, looked up their BMI and found that it was 24 and their doctor had measured it. But then we also have to get to our providers because the providers may then say, well, we don't need to screen until 25, not realizing that the guideline had changed. There's another group that needs to be informed, and that is the payers, uh, either through plans, uh, and uh, this is also another area that we are working on. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, and um, this is related, what challenges have you seen getting word out to providers and patients? Um, well, this is Dr. Chow again. Well, I think, I think the challenges are the same as uh, any time we have new information concerning uh, either treatment, diagnosis, uh, uh, on uh, our um, uh, health uh, uh, problems. Uh, it, is, it is known that it sometimes takes as long as 10 years to actually change a practice. And so there is just so much information today. Our science is moving so rapidly that it's often very difficult for people to keep up with it. And so it really is a challenge to uh, uh, be able to uh, be on the radar of people who are very busy uh, working very hard, trying to keep up with their patient load, trying to also then keep up with the latest science uh, so that it's, it's just uh, almost a need to be repetitive to bring this information to the forefront. Patients can be most helpful in this case because then patients can bring to their doctors who then can, uh, uh, if needed then, uh, look at the information and evidence, and, and with today's technology that you can uh, just Google or uh, look up a search, uh, this information that we've just presented will become self-evident uh, to anyone who reads it, and they will then uh, immediately understand uh, what the issues are and can then work with their patients. So it requires constant, repetitive uh, 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 re, uh, repeating of our messages in order to to uh, get it through uh, so much of the uh, information that doctors have to absorb today. Another challenge from a patient, not even a patient, from a healthy person's perspective is uh, the assumption that a BMI of 23 labels you as obese or overweight in, in an Asian population. And that's not the purpose of the BMI uh, campaign. The BMI at 23, the screen at BMI of 23 um, emphasizes that your risk of diabetes is elevated at a BMI of 23 or higher. And so I think the public percep perception within the Asian American community that, oh no, I'm considered overweight now is not, um, is not a relevant concern. Um, the other challenge is that our community should be informed that we are ultimately responsible for our own preventive care. That means getting a mammogram at a certain age, a colonoscopy at a certain age, 
and likewise a diabetes screen at a certain BMI cut point. Thank you. Uh, another question that has come in, why are Filipinos why are Filipinos at the highest risk of DM2 genetic factors? The, what we found in our study in San Diego is that there are visceral fat. Uh, first of all, Filipinos have a lot of visceral adipose tissue. You saw that in the slide with a woman with a BMI of 26, uh, BMI of 20 and a waistline of 26. It's still unclear why some cultures and why some Asian cultures accumulate fat as visceral adipose tissue, whereas African Americans, even though they're overweight, have very little visceral adipose tissue. What we found in our study is that when you have a lot of visceral adipose tissue, which produces uh, inflammatory markers as well as healthy cytokines, namely adiponectin, high levels of um, visceral adipose tissue downregulates or turns off the, produc the production of this healthy cytokine, adiponectin. You want adiponectin levels to be at high levels, and studies have shown that high levels of adiponectin are associated with a lower risk of diabetes. What we found is that even in our healthiest Filipinos, even those without any glucose abnormalities, their adiponectin levels were very low. Studies in the Philippines have shown a genetic uh, mutation in polymorphisms in the adiponectin receptor. Adiponectin is also very low in Japanese populations, and that's why Japan is the leader in adipocyte biology. So that's that the excess visceral adipose tissue and the consequent low levels of adiponectin explain part of their excess risk of diabetes among Filipinos. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay, another question. Is there a study on central obesity or central adipose tissue rather than lumbar paraspinal adipose tissue amounts? Uh, we've we've attempted to so we've not looked at um, lumbar spinal uh, fat. We've only looked at visceral adipose tissue primarily because uh, it produces inflammatory markers and um, and cytokines. I think the important question is how do you get a thin Asian American person who is considered normal weight or even underweight with a BMI of 20 to lose that visceral adipose tissue. Some lifestyle intervention studies, specifically weight training, have been performed, but only among obese populations. So any type of weight loss will reduce this harmful visceral adipose tissue. Whether it has the same effect on thin um, Asians is still unclear. I think that's a, a study that needs to be Establish. We have to enroll thin Asians into a study where their goal is to lose visceral adipose tissue, um, probably through weight training by increasing their muscle mass, even though they have very low BMIs. Okay, thank you. Um, another question: Have you seen? So let me see this. Are there, have you seen any difference between Asian Americans here in the U.S. versus Asians in their native countries? So I guess, are there any differences that you've seen in terms of being foreign born um, in the Asian American population when you're looking at, at these? Uh, areas? Yes, so the pioneer in these um, migrant versus native population comparisons is Dr. Will Fujimoto, who's looked at diabetes prevalence among people in Japan versus migrants in the United States. And that's for all migrant populations, including people from, from Africa, from Ghana, where diabetes prevalence is low in the home country and then increases in the US. What um, we did is we compared diabetes prevalence among people in the Philippines, third generation Filipinos in Hawaii, and migrants in San Diego. And we found that diabetes prevalence was actually very similar in all three sites 
even though the third generation Filipinos in Hawaii had higher rates of obesity. And this reinforces the fact that obesity is not the only mechanism through which Asians um, acquire diabetes, but it's also other factors like visceral adipose tissue and low adiponectin levels, even though you're thin. I think what's also unique about the, the Philippines and Puerto Rico is that they seem to be the only two countries where diabetes prevalence is similar in the home country and in the U.S. It's largely related to our um, history as a colonial, as a colony of the U.S. so that exposure to a Western diet didn't require migrating to the U.S. All of the fast food franchises were brought to, the, brought to the Philippines and Puerto Rico because that political relationship enabled the economic access. It, it, it's also of interest, uh, Happy, that uh, Dr. George King has been doing a lot of work in Asia and has been a uh, special consultant now to several of the governments there because in India and in China, uh, diabetes is rising rapidly, and whether then this is also related to changes of their diet, et cetera, or all kind of issues that are being studied, and this may now become a real global issue uh, rather than uh, just simply migrating and therefore having changes of diet, et cetera. So I, I think it's a fascinating area. Um, the sad part is that uh, the uh, a problem of diabetes is growing rapidly in Asia, and in fact, the largest number of diabetics in the world will soon be from Asia. Yeah, I, I'd like to reinforce that. The World Health Organization published a diabetes report last month that showed that India and China are actually um, the diabetes capitals of the world currently, meaning they have the largest burden of of diabetes cases and the prevalence, the rates in China are similar to those in Mexico at this moment. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's several questions asking for copies of the slides. We can definitely uh, send a copy of the slides out after the webinar to everyone that's been regist that, that registered. Um, and again, the, the, the webinar, the recording of the webinar will also be available on the Help Forum YouTube channel, which you can also uh, be linked to that. We'll send out a message after the webinar to everyone that's on today. Um, any other questions that people would like to ask? We just have a couple minutes left, so if you have any other questions, please uh, type them into the box. Thank you. These are all really great questions that are coming in. Um, there was one question if, um, about the article that talked about Asians Philippines and Puerto Rico. Do you have a reference for that article that you mentioned? I have. Um, yes, we have a publication, but it's on diabetes prevalence among Filipinos in the Philippines, Hawaii, and the U.S. Okay. We did not have access to Puerto Rican Puerto Rico data. It's uh, data that we. That's a separate study between Puerto Ricans in New York and Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. It was not a Filipino versus Puerto Rico paper. I see. OK. Thanks for clarifying that. Oh, one of the common questions that's often asked is how many new Asian Americans might be diagnosed with diabetes with the new guidelines? And so by lowering the guidelines from a BMI cut point of 25 to 23, we estimate that that would translate into about 70,000 Asian Americans in California who would be diagnosed with the new guidelines since one out of every three Asians uh, resides in California. Nationally, that 70,000 in California might translate to about 200,000 new Asian Americans with diabetes. Wow, okay. And so we'd like to emphasize that those are like 200,000 Americans who could have a better, healthier life if they are diagnosed early and to avoid then, uh, we would hope to be able to avoid the complications of diabetes. Okay. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Um, Dr. Araneta or Dr. Chow, any last words that you'd like to say before we end the webinar here?
Well, I think I just want to again thank the uh, organizers and to ask that if there are um, organizations that would like assistance in bringing this message to their groups, that uh, David Hawks can uh, put you in touch with any of us who could be helpful in this uh, uh, endeavor. I'd like to reiterate our appreciation for hosting this webinar and also for the listeners who have phoned in. I think Dr. Chow and people in San Francisco have had tremendous success with hepatitis B prevention and awareness and hope that we could adopt the same model and, um, and spread the word to Screen at 23. Great. Well, thank you very much. This has been a really helpful webinar. Um, thank you all for joining today. I hope it's been helpful for you. Again, if you have any further questions, um, David Hawk's email address is on your screen. Feel free to send him an email. You can also contact me. Um, my email address is ijohn at apiahf.org. And thank you again for joining, and hope you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.